Hi, everybody. Welcome to the podcast. It may interest you to know. I'm Tony Marcolini. I have a very special guest here today, uh, Captain Peter Weichel. Uh, he is a retired military veteran and uh, award-winning uh, Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, there's so many things I, I want to get into with him, so we're going to jump right in. Welcome, Peter. Well, thank you for having me. So let me take you back Um uh, I want to get to the good stuff. I mean, I'm, I'm very intrigued by the Nobel Peace Prize, but that, that was a long time leading up to that. Uh, let's go back to the beginning. You first entered uh, the military. Were you in the, in the Navy? I know you entered very young. Yeah, two weeks out of high school. Um, I actually wanted to quit high school and go in the Army uh, in my junior year. And the house I was living in, it was relatives about got chained to the house. So um, about uh, three months or four months before, I didn't tell anybody, I went into Port Jefferson and I went to the uh, the Navy, all the recruiters. I somehow, I always liked the Navy. I was in the Suffolk Sea Cadets when I was a kid and went in there. And so um, I signed up under the delayed entry program. I didn't have to tell anybody. And then as soon as I became 18, my signature was valid. And they were allowed to do that by law and they didn't have to tell the parents or anything else. So that's what I did. And then, you know, when I went there, uh, uh, you know, they told me, well, stay away from this organization, the underwater demolition team sail seals, there's suicide missions in Vietnam. Right. So two weeks out of high school, I go in the Navy. And then later on in life, people said, Why'd you go? Why did, why did you go in there? I said, I didn't want anybody to tell me what to do. And as soon as I get off the bus, everyone's yelling at me, telling me what to do. They didn't tell me what to do in my life. But, but um, uh, so, I, so I had that freedom. And then all during boot camp, I was hearing this. Oh, I said, what are those guys over there? Suicide missions in, in, uh, in Vietnam. And, and all we did for the first six weeks was fold clothes because it had to fit in this locker this big. And so they spent all this time folding clothes a certain way, and you'd have to friction iron t-shirts and underwear with a soap dish and a handkerchief, and you were tying knots and you were going to classes, and I just wanted to go to Vietnam. You know, so how, I said, how do you go to war doing this, you know? And, you know, you're a young kid, 18, you have no fear, you know, I read the book, The Green Beret, and so... But for some reason, I, I wound up in the Navy rather than the Army. So then all of a sudden, I asked someone, well, who are these guys? And they said, oh, UDT SEAL suicide missions in Vietnam. So I said, do they have to fold clothes? And someone said, I don't think so. Um, so I said, I'm going to find out about them. So that's how I got into this thing, because I didn't want to fold clothes. I was a good swimmer. I passed the swim test and a PT test. I never lettered in anything in high school. I was on the speech and debate, played drums went home early, lived with Italians. And if you told me I was gonna complete the toughest military training a year and a half later, I'd tell you, you were smoking banana peels. So you wind up volunteering for the, the suicide mission team of Navy SEALs? Well, yeah, it was sort of like, anything's gotta be better than folding clothes. <laughs> At that point, it was sort of like, I'm getting away from know. folding clothes. <laughs> You know, but when you're young, it's sort of like, oh, suicide missions, like it's not going to happen to me. And then, you know, eventually, once I got the training, I went to an A school for electronics uh, be because I scored very, very high uh, on math and science and that sort of stuff. So they sent me to an advanced electronics school and they told me, take the school, take every school the Navy gives you. So I did that first and I went to SEAL training. And then back then it was called UDTB. It wasn't called BUDS, Underwater Demolition Team Basic. That was on the East Coast, and my friend Skip McKay, um, who was dating Maria, um, yeah, he was in uh, the class after mine, and we actually wound up going through training together. So um, I get there, and one of the first things they do is talk to us about the Normandy landings and telling us, you know, they had 75% casualties, and all these guys got killed on the beaches. And so I'm looking around going, well, you know, now I'm 19. It's like, it ain't going to happen to me. You know, I'm not going to be one of the 75%. So that's your mindset when you're young. You you think you're invisible. You don't think you're going to get hurt. And um, and so I, I went through uh, UDTB and it was the last class in the East Coast. So we were supposed to have the last uh, Hell Week class. 
and it was for a while, and then they had to reinstitute it. Um, and so uh, it was it was kind of exciting. And then the day we graduated, they said we have good news and bad news. And so he said, well, give us the good news. And the good news is you're all graduating. Well, it was the last day. Of course, we're all graduating. What's the bad news? They said SEAL Team 2 just cut its commitment to Vietnam. None of you guys are going to get a chance to go to Vietnam. And to be quite frank, I was crushed. Um, so, really? yeah, I, I wanted to go to Vietnam. Um, and I, I, you know, I was in the New York school system and I got a, a region scholarship, not the whole one, but I, I would have gotten some money and I took all college prep things. And so I was very knowledgeable in world history and all the wars. I studied them. I studied Vietnam. I studied political science and took humanities. And you had to take all the, all the sciences and all the math too. Um, but I really read a lot about history and stuff. And, and, and then of course, back then, you know, there were all the World War II combat vets all around us. And, and then there were the movies Combat, you know, and all these other movies. And all I wanted to do was serve my country and keep us safe from communism. And I firmly believed that at that age. And that's why I wanted to serve my country and save us from communism. And I still want to save us from communism. <laughs> so, so what happens next then? I mean, you don't, you don't get deployed to Vietnam. Um, wh so where do you- Skip and I, we, we go to Underwater Demolition Team 21. We're in the same platoon. We wind up uh, going to this winter training and winter training was in Puerto Rico. And um, uh, because you could do a lot of diving there, the, the way, and, and they had jungles, you know, and, and all kinds of good, good training areas. You could do a lot of different training there. The water was nice and you get a lot of diving done. And so in six weeks, you could do a massive amount of training day in and day out. And you, you, you trained five days a week and then you had two night problems every night. And if you were diving, that meant you did three dives, you did uh, 10 dives plus another two dives. So you did 12 dives a week. That was a lot of diving. And Skip and I were, we were not only swim buddies, but we were also dive buddies. Uh, we were swim buddies in training and then at UDT 21. And then, so I just happened to be, and it took a long time to get on a deployment and you weren't considered qualified unless you went through training, you went through jump school, you went through underwater swim school, and then you got a deployment under your belt. And it could take you like a year and a half, two years just to get a deployment. And I just happened to be outside of the headquarters building when Lieutenant Steffens comes out, who would eventually be my CEO one day and then become an admiral. And I'm a seaman apprentice or a seaman. And he says, Michael, uh, do you want to go to the Mediterranean with first platoon? I said, absolutely. He says, you have three more volunteers. I said, yes, Skip McKay, um, Steve, uh, um, um, Frank Wysocki and, and, and Mike Schaefer. And he said, okay, I got those names. Tell them they're all going. You guys can fly back on a plane, get a weekend back at Little Creek and you fly back with first platoon. Voila. Nine months later, I'm on my first deployment. It was like, it was meant to be. And so we went to the Mediterranean and, um, you know, we did a lot of, a lot of swimming, a lot of operating. We did a lot of jumping. We met a lot of foreign counterparts. Uh, I got, you know, I got to see, like, we got to see everything. We, the, 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 the cathedral in Sevilla, Rhoda, we, you know, we went to Rome, Naples, Athens. We got to see the, the, the Acropolis from the ship, which was amazing to see from out at sea. We went to Turkey. I got sick eating the food there. <laughs> And um, I met, you know, the, the first woman I would marry and I got married and like a lot of seals, I got divorced too. I got married too young. And, um, and it was a rough time back then. The teams probably had the highest divorce rate in the Navy and in the military. You're always gone. And we were all too young. We had too much testosterone. And, you know, we were just bad boys. And that's just the way that was, the, you know, no excuses. It's just the way it was. And, and yeah. so... Yeah, so there comes a point in time, uh, I, I want to say, when you're uh, ultimately sent to Lebanon, right? Yeah, that was after, I'll, I'll tell you about that. So Skip and I, w w the way we got the SEAL team back then, there, there was only like a couple hundred SEALs in the country. 
We came back from the deployment and SEAL Team 2 put a call out for two people. 40 guys put in for it and we both got it. And then we went to SEAL Team 2. And then he got out, out after four years and went to Rutgers, eventually got an MBA. I stayed in for six years and then joined the reserves. And I, I still maintain my affiliation with, um, with an underwater demolition team reserve unit. So I never really left. And um, I got my degree in political science. I got a commission and, and I did my first two tours, one with SEAL Team 1 and then Underwater Demolition Team 11. And then from there, I, I got detailed to United Nations True Supervision Organization um, and, and they had different- Now, now if, I could just, if I could just interrupt with you, when you, you're saying Underwater Demolition Team, what, what, would, what would that team be responsible to do? Okay, so you had two basic teams back then, underwater demolition teams, and then from them, they took guys and they made the SEAL teams. So if you, if you, you can think of it like this, the original guys, the original frogmen were the Naval Combat Demolition Units and, and some other units. Uh, we have, we, it was a, a really complex history from World War II. And, and then from that, also World War II, there were the underwater demolition teams and their job was to clear the landing beaches for amphibious assaults. Very, very dangerous job. And so the first guys in on the beach, getting shot at, clearing obstacles underwater, so landing craft can land and not get turned over by all the obstacles in the water with, with, with the underwater demolition teams. Extremely dangerous job. What, you know, in Normandy, like I said, 70% casualties in Normandy, they only gave out three presidential unit citations and the NCDU got one. Think about that. You know, the Rangers at Point to Huck were the other ones that got another one. I don't know who the third unit was. So, um, so all SEALs uh, uh, go, go back to the Naval Combat Demolition Units and the Underwater Demolition Teams and are called Frogmen. And we still call SEALs Frogmen now. Um, and then in 1983, or was it 84? 1983, I think, uh, the Navy decommissioned all the SEAL uh, underwater demolition teams and recommissioned them at SEAL teams. So instead of just having SEAL team one and SEAL team two, we now had, we now had uh, SEAL team one, SEAL team five, was, SEAL team three was being commissioned, SEAL team two, SEAL team uh, four, and, um, and then they made two um, SEAL delivery vehicle teams. Um, and, and those were teams just for, for, for lack of, they're wet submersibles, but think of them as like mini subs. They're really not mini subs. They're actually submersibles. And when you dive them, they flood up and, and you're on scuba. Uh, so we had, so from UDTs, we evolved into more, into more SEAL teams and, and SEAL delivery vehicle teams. Um, Wow, so I'm sorry, I just wanted to understand what that was, but I, I'd asked you about, uh, uh, and you were in the middle of answering me, I apologize. Oh, no, 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 uh, that's okay. Being, being deployed to Lebanon. Yeah, so so my my third job, my third detail was to uh, the United Nations Truth Super Supervision Organization. And once you get there, uh, which is a government house in Jerusalem. Um, and so the UN actually occupies it's on a building that's on the heat on, on the hill of evil council, and you know what they did to Christ on the hill of evil council. So, uh, <laughs> what a way to start off that job, right? So, um, they detailed me to Observer Group Lebanon, which was in Naharia, and then you would. So, my first job there was um, we did uh, observation posts, and we monitored the. The, um, the armistice of 1948 um, along the Lebanese border between Israel and the Lebanese border. And then they put these observation posts all around the border. And, they, and, and then the United Nations interim forces in Lebanon were, that whole South Lebanon was apportioned into military districts so that they would have the, fin, the Finns, the Finnish, the Finns had a battalion and they were responsible for an area. Um, and uh, the Norwegians were responsible for an area. The French were responsible, the, the Senegalese, the Fijians. They, so it was a mishmash of all these different 
military organizations and they had a headquarters. And when you went to lunch there, it was like being at the chow hall of the United Nations. You could hear like, like 50 different languages going at once. It was crazy, but everybody knew how to speak English. And so uh, I was there and my first six months I did um, observation posts and you just observe and report it and then you went on a patrol. And, and right before I was scheduled to go on a team, which did nothing but patrols. And you, so you would go on an, uh, you would go on an OP with a foreign officer. Oh, by the way, when you were an UNSO, you were an unarmed observer, no guns. You had to learn how to talk your way out of everything. And there were times bad guys held you up to steal your stuff. And so you got AK-47s pointed in your face and you just had to be cool and and, and, and go with the flow and, and not get shot. So that was very, very interesting. And, and you also wound up saving a lot of lives. Um, and, but so uh, I did observation posts and then on my very last observation post, um, my partner did some things which caused an accident and I went in to get him out of a bad spot and I was wearing flip-flops and running shorts and um, a six foot, a five foot butane gas bottle was spewing gas and I picked him up and as I threw him and said, get the hell out of here, it ignited, it exploded. And I was burned 75%. Oh my goodness. And why I'm still alive, I'm a miracle of God. I have no idea how I got through that. And so I, uh, I wound up getting us out of there, called in a medevac, um, and uh, long story on that. And then I wound up, they, uh, he got a shot of morphine, but he was still screaming. So he would burn 45% and I thought he was worse than me. So in the helicopter, I was, I was having an argument with the doctor. He wanted to give me the shot of morphine, but Sergio was screaming at the top of his lungs in my ear. So I said, no, give him the shot. He said, he's got a shot. I said, well, give him the shot. And then so he says, no, this is for you. You need it. I said, if you don't give it to him, I, and I was cursing at the doctor, I said, I'll take it from him and I'll, I'll give it, I'll effing give it to him myself. So he leans over, he jams him with another shot of morphine. Sergio goes to sleep and the guy looks at me, he says, you're crazy. And, and, and I said, fine, you know, and, and I said, like, or I said something like, shut up. And so then I huddled down and he said, I don't have to listen to that. And I don't have to listen to him. And all I got to do is get my way back to the, the field hospital and everything will be okay. And I had no idea the extent of my burns. All I knew was the pain came from everywhere at once. And it was almost like you couldn't process it, but I wound up doing everything right. Um, and that was, somebody asked me why. And I said, well, up to that, I had so much training that my mind, the synapse, everything knew exactly what to do. It was like I was on autopilot. And I never trained to get burned that much, but I did everything right because I had so much training that everything kicked in and you just kind of know what to do and you do it. And uh, so went to the field hospital and uh, finally got some morphine, fell asleep, woke up next morning and I'm looking at Sergio and I see all these tubes and I go, and I see this blister on his chest. I go, no wonder he's he was like that, right? So then I look over. I look over to the left and I see the same amount of tubes going into me, you know, and I'm, and I'm going, hmm. I, li I lift up my sheet and I see this blister this big. They're going all the way down the bottle, bottom, all the way down, all, all the way all that, down my legs and on my feet and everything. So I put it back and I think to myself and I said, boy, using a heap of trouble. <laughs> and wow. so they sent us to Rambam Hospital. They said minimum eight weeks. I walked out in 12 days. Don't ask me how I did that. I walked out in 12 days. And then 18 days after that, I went back on patrol. Oh my goodness. Wow. If you touched my skin, it would break and bleed, but we were shorthanded. And they said, is there any possibility you can go out on patrol? I said, absolutely. I want, I want to go across the border. That's where the war is. Even though we were unarmed observers, you know, the only way you can learn about <clears throat> war is to be in one. Um, it's the only way you can learn, you know, you, you can't learn from movies. You have to, you have to, you have to count and confirm the dead. You have to see people shot, you know, then you have to see them in the hospital. You, you've got, you, you know, you, you've got to be shot at a number of times. So you understand what all this is about. Um, you have to see the fear in people's eyes. 
uh, as they're getting shot at, you know, innocent civilians. And um, so the only way, and a friend of mine told me that, you know, after Grenada, he said, he said, Pete, this is a great job from you. you you're an officer now. You have to learn about war. You're going to take guys to war one day. The sooner you learn about it, whether you can carry a gun or not, you take that job. And he was a really good friend of mine, seriously wounded in Vietnam, uh, Kerry Heinrich great guy um and i took his advice and i took that job and i got hurt severely but i learned a lot of lessons from that and and then fast forward to these wars when guys started getting ptsd i knew exactly what was happening because i had to suffer through that myself and figure it out because they didn't have a name for it when i got it all i knew is i was run down i didn't feel well you know um Every now and then I got depressed, but I get out of it right away. And um, so I, I knew what they were going through. So all the lessons I learned from Lebanon um, helped me, you know, later on in life when I had to, when I had to lead troops uh, on combat missions. And so, so the, the, the thing with the Nobel Peace Prize is the Nobel Committee said it was never going to give the Nobel Peace Prize to military people what they awarded uh, us the Nobel Peace Prize was 40 years of peacekeeping from 1948 to 1988. And they said, we can't deny what these thousands of uh, peacekeepers did to try and keep the peace in Lebanon at great risk to their own lives. Uh, so they awarded us. So years later, you know, I left in 1985. A friend of mine said, hey, Pete, we got the Nobel Peace Prize. I said, what are you smoking? You know, he goes, yeah, look, it's a Time magazine. We got the Nobel Peace Prize. Well, the government never gave us our medals. If you wanted one, you had to buy your own medal. I haven't bought my own medal because I'm not going to buy my own medal. It's supposed to be awarded to you. But um, be that as it may, you know, we were all, we all have the Nobel Peace Prize. And so that's, that's, uh, that's quite an honor. And uh, so that's the moment you, you, you hear from a friend. Uh, that you're getting the Nobel Peace Prize. Like you hadn't been notified uh, prior to that. You kind of learned about it that way. No, no, we were both in the same command and we were both over there and, or and maybe he was in a different command and we run into each other. He says, hey, Pete, did you hear? We got the Nobel, it's right here in, in time or something like the time or Newsweek. It might've been time. And you know, that's how, yeah, that's how I found out. <laughs> were you excited? I mean, I assume you ran and got the magazine. <laughs> Yeah, well, yeah, I was, I was a bit excited, you know, it was sort of like, okay, I got the Nobel Peace Prize, what do I do with it, who gets the million dollars, and, you know, and it's not that I need, you know, I, it, it, and then, you know, it sinks in, wow, quite, what an honor, you know, uh, and, you know, the, the first military group to get that, um, and so, yeah, it's, it's a big honor. Um, what, what's your most memorable moment? Uh, in from your military years? You know, there's a lot of them, but uh, I'll share one because um, someone once asked me, what was the hardest thing that ever happened to you? So I told him about the burns in great detail. Sure. That would qualify, you know, um, that that would qualify is because they say burns are the worst pain you can feel and it happened so suddenly and i was wearing flip-flops and nylon running shorts <laughs> shorts of vaporized and and when it, when i ran outside the building my flip-flops were on fire at the top so i had to get out of those things and i was running around naked <laughs> so um in the hot sun and that wasn't any fun either um trying to take care of my partner um and so i tell them that story. And, um, and then I said, but that wasn't the hardest thing I ever had to do. And they said, what could be harder than that? And I told them the story when I was deputy commander at SOC South, Special Operations Command South, a, a theater uh, special operations command, which had purview for all special operations in South America. Um, we had uh, a SEAL commanding officer uh, on a helicopter. He was the first guy in the door, um, Pete Oswald, Naval Academy, great guy. He's probably going to be an admiral one day, leading his troops from the front. He was sitting 
in the door on the edge, holding onto the fast rope. Something went wrong. The rope got cut and he fell something like 60 to 80 feet to his death. He was wearing all, all this equipment. Uh, the general was away. Um, and I'm the next senior guy. I'm, I'm the acting commanding general. Uh, so I put on my whites with my ribbons and everything, and I had to go notify his wife. Wow, that, that had to be really hard. Yeah, and um, it doesn't hit you then because you have to put your game face on. The look on her face, I'll never forget it. And it it the look was almost like I killed him. Uh, when, when, when you go to do that, and they don't mean that, you know, um, but she never, I saw a number of times again, and she never looked at me the same again, you know, uh, you're the bearer of bad news. And the beauty though is um, commanding general's wife, God bless her soul, she passed away, Marsha Butler, um, she brought a bunch of the wives. And as soon as I got doing that, Marsha just knocked, they told me the way it was going to go. You're going to give her the bad news and you're going to get out of there and we're going to take over. And, and she just knocked me away and they just surrounded her and I just got out of there um, because they know how to deal with it better. Uh, so, you know, I tell people, yeah, uh, th that was the hardest thing I've ever had to do was, was tell would tell a teammate's wife that uh, he was just killed. He was deceased. That's tough. Yeah, yeah I would imagine the, uh, like you said, the look in her eyes, uh, I guess it's forever imprinted in your brain. Yeah, you know, so that's the worst thing anybody has to do. And then, you know, fast forward even to that, I was at a the mass burial um, of, 12 or 13 seals at Arlington National Cemetery or 12, most I think mostly seals. It might've been some Air Force uh, or, or some army and they don't like to do mass burials. And th that was so sad at the very last casket. Um, you know, we let most of the family get up front, you know, and, and it was sort of like, I've, I've been to so many funerals at Arlington, it's, it's, what you have to do uh, and we were towards the end and when it was over on the very last casket I'll never forget this um, I saw the mother and the wife leaning on the casket crying their eyes out the father the two fathers were um, they were just in front of the casket with their head down and the little boy took the American flag that was presented and he was acting like he was shooting the enemy. Now, if that didn't bring you to tears, you know, wasn't a dry eye in the house. And, um, and you know, you, you, you look back on some of those things. It's like the older, and I talked to another really good friend, another Navy captain that worked for me and then it wound up exceeding me. Roger Herbert, love the guy, great leader. Uh, we, we went to dinner one time uh, after I retired, and I think maybe after he retired, and he said, you know, the older I get, the more emotional I get. And I go, yeah, me too. I don't know what it is, you know. Um, um, but um, so, so those, those are the hardest things that you do. You were actually in combat where, you know, you 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 – People tried to kill you and, and you killed other people. Um, I, I have to believe that left its impact in your brain. It does with everybody. You know, this is, this is part and parcel of, um, of, uh, of, of the job. This is, this is what you right. sign up for and this is what you do. And, um, and you know, when, when I retired, I gave a speech and I told people, I said, and you retired after 39 years, I want to say, right? I mean, you were yeah, there. 30, 39 <laughs> years, four months, three weeks, six days, 10 hours, five minutes and three seconds. And nobody was counting. 
I have a different <laughs> energy for that. Uh, but that's the way I usually tell people uh, because I take the good times and the bad times. It was the best job I was ever going to have with the best people in the world. You know, people that always had your six um, would always be honest with you. If you screwed up, they didn't have a problem telling you, you know, you screwed up and you need to improve. And But in other terms, <laughs> you know, we don't have a problem telling each other um, uh, that or, or and we're, we're our own worst critics. You know, at the end of a mission, and no matter what we do, we have a debrief. And in order to, for us to become, like in order, to, they said in order to become a more perfect union, blah, 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 in, in, in our declaration and constitution. Well, for us, in order to become a more perfect operator and you'll never get there, we debrief everything. And our debriefs can be brutal on each other. And, and we can get very, very introspective uh, even after that, it's like, what could I have done better? You know, um, and even now as a musician, it's the same thing. I, I, I play a gig and if I record it, I listen to it. It's like, why did I do that? <laughs> you know, I, I, you know and, 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 and that carries over to things that I do now. Um, you're always trying to seek perfection. You know, I, I was digging in the garden and, and my friend who's a master gardener says, you know, your soil is compacted. Here's my rototiller, but you're going to have to dig down eight inches first and, 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 and then till the soil. No, I had to dig down two feet, turn everything over, add in all this peat moss and all this other stuff and then till it. You know, so it's sort of like this. this if you're a seal, there's no easy way. You know, you're going to do it better than anybody else because that's just the way, you know, that's what you learn in this business. You learn to take care of your swim buddy first. And then, the, and then the rest of the organization, but it's always your swim buddy, you and your swim buddy, and then, and then you learn to seek perfection. And none of us know we're, we're never going to see, we're never going to get perfection, but we're always looking for it. We want to become a better shot, a better, a better um, a jumper. You know, we, we, we want to get better in everything we do. And, and, um, and, you know, we're an organization, I said, we're an organization, you would be surprised how studious and how much seals read. Every, every great seal has got a huge library. You got to read. You got to you got to be smart about what you're doing. You have to know the history. You got to get better. And it's you just don't read about war. You read about business. I remember. I think it was Peter Schwartz. We had to read a book, The Art of the Long View. You know, the four stars sent them to all his commanding officers. All these books, and you had better read them because we ran into you and asked you about the book. You better have a comment about the book. Uh, and then the Commodores would do that. You know, they would get all the commanding officers together and they would say, uh, Bob Schultz was great at that. You know, he'd say, okay, we're going to have a round table, blah, blah, blah. Um, uh, tell us about a book you've read and, and what you got out of it. And, um, and it, was, it was important to do that. It was important to read. It was important to open up your mind. Um, and... Um, yeah, so this is this is this is like this is like the best job in the world. Can you can you talk a little bit about Mission Ready Inc? Oh, Mission Ready was when I retired. My friend Skip they um, they had a sleep remedy and a couple other things. So we were going to have this nutraceutical company, and my friend wanted me, you know, to be part of it and then eventually be the president of this thing and. Um, so I was initially involved as like a co-founder and I was like, um, and we, we had this sleep solution that actually worked. Uh, it was called sleep ready. And so I hadn't had any REM sleep probably the last 13 years of my career or so I didn't have any REM sleep. It's just the way it was. Everything backs up. You have the spouts of the PTSD, you're working. I was working the Office of Naval Intelligence um, and uh, I had a couple really hard landings in Puerto Rico when I was deputy commander there and herniated my disc and, and it took forever to heal. It's still not totally healed. And so between the back pain and then, you know, you break bones during this thing and, you know, dur during your time and 
Um, and so your geometry is off. You sleep the wrong way if you break a collarbone and then your shoulder starts hurting and you get older and you still, I'm, I'm, I'm still doing a lot of stuff as I'm getting older. And then finally one guy looked at me and he says, Michael, stop jumping. You don't have to jump anymore. <laughs> Got nothing to prove to anybody. And um, so, uh, so your injuries start catching up with you. Uh, and, um, and I just didn't sleep well and you, and you working long hours and you're worrying about stuff. And, uh, I didn't have a good marriage at the end. And, um, uh, so I didn't sleep well. And, and then on top of that, a, a lot of pilots and a lot of seals wind up getting obstructive sleep apnea. Um, and then, so a good friend of mine who was a PA, who was seal PA said, you need to take a sleep study, dude. And so like, okay, I take the sleep study. And they said, oh yeah, you got obstructive sleep apnea real bad. You need to be on a CPAP. And, you know, uh, so um, they thought, you know, they, you're, you're going to be the poster child for mission ready. So we did that for a while and the company wasn't going good. And I said, hey, can I be the president of this thing? And they said, yeah, the first thing I did was, was, fire the guy running it because he, he we ran it into the ground. We kept it going for a while. We sold a few products and then, you know, it wasn't sustainable. Um, but there was a lot of people that, that this, this particular uh, concoction, it worked for people. There was a guy, I had a customer who worked in offshore oil rigs. And the same thing, he said, I haven't slept for 15 years and I found out about your stuff and I tried it. And he said, it's the only way I can get to sleep. And so this stuff worked and, and who knows what became of it. You know, we had to fold the company. It was fun for a while. And, um, you know, you met a lot of people and you helped some people get some sleep. It was it. And that was that. I see that you've been in Washington um, at different, you know, at the at the Capitol, um, you know, with different uh, congressmen and the like. Uh, do you keep your hand in legislation that would help veterans or? Well, what happened was, um, once again, Skip uh, introduced me to these people. Um, um, uh, Peter Cove and uh, Dr. Lee Bowes, and they were married. She, she kept her name. And they had a company called America Works, and they got people from welfare to work very successful at doing that. And they started a veterans program. Uh, so they wanted me to be in there, you know, help them get a veterans program going. And they wanted to open up an office in Washington, D.C. And I lived in Arlington. So uh, I, um, I met them and I started working for them. I first started consulting. And the funniest thing happened, you know, I, they had me go, they, they had a guy that, um, Silverstein, who was really great at researching and finding all these places, you know, and he would say, go here and meet these people, go here and meet these people. So I went to meet all these people and they, they, they put a, a, a proposal out and was the Department of Labor running the Veterans Reintegration uh, Program, Veterans Reintegration yeah, Program, and it, it helped veterans get from, from welfare to work and get them a house and, 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 and get them a job. And so I walked into this one place where these guys were, they worked for, they worked for, um, it might've been a non, I think it was a nonprofit and they were involved. I didn't know they were going to be involved in the selection for who was going to get a grant to do this. And Peter and Lee wanted a grant. Well, I went in and I just walked in and there are these two African-American guys, both Vietnam vets. One guy was actually like an albino and he, and they both loved jazz. And I was starting to play jazz again and being a jazz musician. So I said, hey, that's cool. You know, blah, I, I play drums. So we started talking and I made friends with these guys, right? And so when the selection came out, they didn't say anything. And when it was over, they said, hey, Pete, when you, we saw, we saw your company, America Works, and we knew it was you. So you got selected, you know? <laughs> so, you, you know, all this stuff, and, and Peter and Lee had me um, uh, testify before the, the Veterans Affairs Committee on Homeless Veterans. And right before 
I, I went to testify, you know, so I walked to the, whatever building it was, the Rayburn building. There was a bunch of them right there. So I walked up to one guy who was wearing this military garb and I went and talked to him and I said, were you a soldier? He said, yeah, Vietnam. I said, thanks for your service. Are you homeless? Yeah. And we had a little chat. So when I went up there, they said, where are the homeless veterans? I said, well, there's one guy sitting about 250 yards from the building. If, 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 you, if you want to go down the walkway towards the train station, you'll probably see him there. Why don't you buy him a cup of coffee or, or, or words to that effect, you know? And Wow. Uh, so that you testified to that. Yeah, I, I told him, yeah, the, 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 the homeless veterans are right outside your door. Um, and so we, we got... America Works got the money. I helped them open an office, and and I believe they still have the office, um, and they're still doing they're still doing great work there, helping people get from welfare to work. I'm I'm pretty sure they still have the office, but they were really really good at at, at doing that. And then um, uh, veterans would come in. So there was uh, another gentleman working for them in New York and I just happened to be there and I was getting ready to go on a train and go back to Washington, D.C. And he, the one guy says, Pete, I need you to stay. I go, okay, why? He says, there's a guy coming in and he's suicidal. And so we brought the guy in and he didn't have a job. He was homeless and he was crying. He couldn't even buy his daughter an ice cream cone. And so we took us about two and two and a half hours to calm him down. We said, we're going to get you a job. Your life is going to get better. Don't worry. And so we calmed him down. He didn't commit suicide. And he, um, and at the time, eight veterans a day were committing suicide. Now I think it's up to anywhere from 18 to 20. And all of these presidents we, we have said, oh, we're going to cure this. We're going to cure veteran homelessness. They haven't cured anything. It's gotten worse. It's gotten worse. Wow. So, yeah, so uh, this is an important, this is a really important issue. Um, and, and are you still working uh, with, uh, with the government in any capacity to, to assist? Oh, no, I, I, I stopped doing that. And um, I, I lived in Griswold for six years and then um, had a relationship that didn't work out. It was good for the first four years next two years so it, it was kind of funny thing um skip you know i told him i don't know if this is going to work out skip you know, when you get older it's harder to really make that connection and keep it going um and so he he says he takes out this key says here's your escape and evasion plan okay so i call him up one day and I go i'm executing the escape and evasion plan he had a house in ridgefield fully furnished all the clothes were still there what are you doing with this place? He says, I'm going to, I'm going to fix it up and sell it. Well, let, let me help you. You know? So after about four months, I said, what do you want for rent? He goes, nothing. Just, just, just pay the electric bill. And then he got sick a couple. Well, it took four years to sell the darn house. In the meantime, I fell in love with the town of Ridgefield. I got a band together during COVID. I'm playing with Grammy award winning musicians. Don't ask me how that happened. You know, um, I, I now play at the Richfield Theater Barn. I played concerts all over town. I played in New York City. Um, and I'm playing with Grammy award-winning musicians, critically acclaimed guys. My, my keyboard player is Rob Aries from Average White Band, who's played with everybody in New York for 40 years. Got a bass player uh, who's a jazz and bad, Brian Glassman, jazz ambassador for the State Department. And he teaches at Princeton, Scott Wenhold, he's in the Village Vanguard Jazz Orchestra, has a Grammy, um, tenor player, um, um, Ralph Lalama, he's got three Grammys, played at Carnegie Hall, Scott's played at Carnegie Hall, has three Grammys, plays at the Village Vanguard, played with Joe Morello for three years, I play with another tenor player, Russ Nolan, critically acclaimed. You know, and then you play with these other guys when you can't get them that are subs and they're all fabulous musicians. And it's sort of like, <clears throat> why am I playing with these guys? And the first time I played with Scott at my favorite Italian restaurant, Gallo, all of a sudden we play the head in on this jazz tune and Russ is playing a solo like I've never heard him play before. And, and, and it's like, okay, something's up. 
He gets done with the solo. I play a role. Scott goes into his, and it's like, I'm just keeping time. And the first thing in my mind is, what am I doing here? You know? And the second thing is, hold on for dear life. And the third thing is, Michael, don't screw this thing up. Just play time and do nothing but play time behind this guy. Yeah. <clears throat> and then Rob plays and, and uh, he's playing bass lines uh, and keyboard at the same time. And so we got through the gig and it's sort of like, whoo, <laughs> you know, and so, and then COVID hit and I started, um, I got a great retirement. And so there were no gigs. And people said, hey, can you play this outdoor thing? Um, and I thought, yeah. So I asked, hey, got, hey cats, can, can you guys play this thing? I'll pay you, you know, and, um, and I pay them better than probably anybody else. And, uh, and they're worth it. And so now when we play at the Richfield Theater Barn, I told Pam, who's great, she's the executive director, um, Pam Jones. I said, we, got, we have to start paying musicians what they're worth. You know, they play in New York and, they, and, and, and then they don't get a lot of money and people take advantage of these guys and they have to play because they have to earn money. But any great musician has to be in front of an audience. He can only practice so much. You know, he gets his energy from playing in front of an audience. So I wound up getting these gigs and sometimes there was only like 16 people in the audience. But the way I looked at it was, these are the best jazz lessons I'm ever going to get. And, and so they would spring all these little tricks on me and they would do things and they wouldn't tell me and I'd have to react to them and then they'd laugh and smile at me. And, you know, it's the way you learn how to play this music. So on Make Music Day, uh, coming up next Tuesday, we're, I'm playing where I live up at Rainbow Lake in front of a friend's house. He's also a retired Navy captain. He's president of the association. And um, I'm going to have... Ralph and, and all the cats, plus Ralph's wife, we did a couple gigs, I've done three gigs with her, and she's a fabulous jazz singer. And uh, during COVID, we also did a, a fundraiser for the Ridgefield Symphony Orchestra, which I donate to and I'm associated with. And they weren't playing and, and the musicians weren't making money. So I did a rehearsal at a friend's house, um, uh, because it's essentially a new band and now I'm going to play in front of 150 people and, and a week later so we we did this rehearsal I paid them and then then I paid them again to do the fundraiser and I, a good friend of mine who owns a business contributed fourth I told him about it he says he says do you do you want sponsorship I said no I'm going to take care of the band but the, the RSO really needs money for its musicians. He donated $4,000. And then they, they, they put out a promo for this thing, sold 150 tickets in two days and 190 people showed up, you know, so they had to get extra chairs and everything. And we played under a tent at the, at the Ridgefield, uh, right next to the Ridgefield Playhouse and just did, and, and another guy, uh, this other great guy in town, there's a lot of wealthy people with deep pockets and they're philanthropists. He paid this guy two thousand dollars to record the darn, the the, the to, to record the concert, and you know, and so there's all these really wonderful people. We made a bunch of money for the RSO, and I, I now have friends in the RSO. You know, um, some of the the drummers and, and and some of the musicians, and and Lori Kanegi, who's the executive director, she's a phenomenal woman. How she does what she does and gets everything done is just amazing. Um, the whole crew there. So I'm involved more with the arts here and I'm buying a drum set for the high school because the jazz band drum set is a piece of junk. So it's sort of like, okay, we're, we're, we're gonna help these kids out. We're gonna get things going. So this is what I do now. So, I mean, now you, you went from uh, trauma on a daily basis to uh, this is wonderfully exciting second career. Uh, that's that's a pretty amazing story. Well, I mean, you, you mentioned that you liked jazz uh, and you liked music early on in life. You said, I think you said you did it in high school. I played in high school. Yeah. I had, I had bands. I played at weddings. I played my first wedding at <clears throat> 17 and I got paid in 1969. I got paid $40, believe it or not, for a wedding back then. Um, 
it must feel a little bit like coming home, right? I mean, something you loved when you were a teenager and then you have this opportunity to revisit it yep. uh, at the end of, you know, your career, this magnificent, you know, Nobel Peace Prize winning career. Um, and then you get to move back into something that was a passion when you were young. And I could see how you, you're, you know, how you light up. Uh, I mean, how much you love music and connecting in this way. Well, it's like I, I went from one band of brothers, and they're still brothers, to another band of brothers. And here, sure. here's the interesting thing about musicians. So when you, when guys will make mistakes, and I make these little mistakes all the time. Nobody knows it. The band covers. They race in and do something. You know, it's, it's, it's like they go out there and they take fire for you, you know, uh, I, I mean, really, but they do it musically and everybody supports everybody. And then, you know, a lot of musicians, you know, obviously what, what I do, I'm going to be a constitutional conservative. I'm just, that's who I am. A lot of musicians are, are, are more liberal, but you want to know something? It's all about the tune. It's all about the music. It's not about our views on anything else. Once we're playing a tune, we're all in it for this tune. It's 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 about jazz. It's about it's about making music, and you're dedicated to that and towards each other. And this is what I love about music, and I love about a band because <clears throat> it's teamwork. <clears throat> you have to give of yourself, and you learn that in the teams early on. You don't do things for yourself. You do things for the team. It's all about the team. It's all about your swim buddy. You look after him first. He looks after you. You never worry about yourself. So it, it, it's like I went from the thing I was doing to the thing I was doing, but differently. So, you know, um, instead of doing national defense and, and, you know, doing the things we need to do to keep the, the, the country safe, I now put smiles on people's face, faces and I, and I entertain people. And um, so and creatively, what, what is your creative process, right? Is there something before you get ready to, you know, to start performing? Is there something that, is there a ritual you have? Is there a process or is it for you? I just, as soon as I get behind the drums, I'm on. There's nothing that comes in advance for me. No, you know why? Because, you know, you'll, um, at first I used to get the, I used to get these little jitters, you know, because it's sort of like, I don't want to make a mistake. Stage what the hell fright. Up here, you know, uh, I get this whole audience just looking at me, you know, and, uh, and they're going to hear my little mistakes and they don't. Um, and um, so um, there's, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll do some sticking patterns. I'll try to stay loose and everything. And then what I'll, what I'll try to do is just talk to all the cats beforehand. You know, how's it going? Blah, blah, blah. Here's the set list, you know. And I'm, I'm the band leader, but, but I'm, I'm not a dictator. It's like, look, if you, if you don't like a tune, just you will play another tune. It doesn't matter. It's all it's all about the band and it's all about the tunes and and make you know and 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 winning over the audience. And and and, and, and uh, this is a good time to bring in in my rules because I, I I apply them. I created them when I when I had command of SEAL Delivery Vehicle Team Two, which is a SEAL team. Um, but so at any rate, I try to take care of everybody. I go to the gig. I make sure they have all water. I bring extra beer. I bring beer. I bring wine, some snacks, you know, make sure everybody's happy. I take care of my troops. They're my troops. And uh, I make sure everyone's feeling good and everything. And as soon as we count down the first tune, it's like you're there. You know, you just swing it, baby. Swing these guys. My job is to, as a drummer, my job is to make them sound good. It, you know, the, the drummer chorea really is, is the person who really choreographs the music. The bass player actually keeps the beat. Drummers can keep a beat, but the bass player, I mean, he's really the man. And, and, uh, and the rhythm section really can really propel, because stop and think about it. You play the head end of a tune, and then when the horn players do their solos, you know, one guy takes a solo, the other guy's step aside so the solo was complete. So they're not playing all the time. Now they'll come in and play a couple of figures every now and then, 
Um, but the rhythm section goes all goes the entire time. And then when the bass player takes a solo, it's just the drummer and the bass player. And the, um, the keyboard player will play a couple of things. And every now and then, you know, a horn player will throw something in. Uh, and, and so the rhythm section is going, is going the whole time. My job is to make everybody else sound great. You know, so um, sometimes playing less is more. Ringo Starr was a great drummer, not because he had the greatest technical skill, but, but he often played less. And when he did play something, it was right where it was supposed to be. It was in the pocket and it was perfection. And um, was Ringo Starr a buddy rich? No. But did he get inducted into the uh, Percussive Art Society Hall of Fame? Oh, yes, he did. You know, and, and so sometimes less is more. And this is the interesting thing that, that you learn about, about jazz, you know. Um, and, and even when drummers take a solo, it's like a horn player can play, but sooner or later he's got to take a breath, okay? And sometimes breathing or not playing everything all at once right away is a good thing. And you learn that as a drummer too. It's sort of like, um, you don't have to play a whole lot of stuff all at once. You can kind of play some rhythms, leave a little rest in there, let that sink in, hit something else. And so uh, th this, this is a nice transition in, into your life. And, and, but, but I do want to mention two things. I want to get into rules, but I wanted to ask you, you ever read The Alchemist by Paolo Coelho? Yes. Okay, so he talks about his personal legend. Most people never get a personal legend. They never get one, unfortunately. I was so fortunate to get a personal legend by being a SEAL for 38 years. How blessed am I to get a second personal legend? I'm a jazz drummer playing with the coolest cats in the business. You know, I'm blessed. Um, I couldn't disagree. I mean, I think you are blessed in a lot of ways uh, besides having these two amazing careers, certainly surviving, uh, you know, what you've endured. And I started out in a place called Harlem Hospital Father was a heroin addict, went to 16 different schools by the time I got out of high school. I used to watch my father shoot up, and then he was taken away from me when I was seven years old, seven or eight years old. Got moved around from boarding house to boarding house, camp, military school, you name it, and, and found a way to make it. And so when I hear people say, well, everything's, and there's people that had it worse than me. But everyone's got a chance in this great country of ours. This is a great country. You know, you can make it. And, and so it's also incumbent sometimes upon the rest of us who have made it to find those people who are having trouble, who haven't make it, made it, and give them, you can't motivate them. Motivation comes from within, but you can reassure them and help them to try and pull those boots up. Uh, the, the thing I do want to uh, tell you about is these three rules. So when, when I, because I applied them to music later on, um, and I've told this to musicians, I used to go to Maryland Summer Jazz and, um, and I had to give a speech because I, I, I gave out some scholarships to high school students to, to go to an adult jazz camp. Um, kids that the parents couldn't afford to send them. So I'll, I'll do it. Why not? It's 800 bucks, big deal, you know? So, uh, but anyway, so I took over SEAL team and I thought, how am I going to keep everybody straight? There's all these rules and regulations. I don't know them all. Nobody knows them all. There's manuals upon manuals. You know, it's like the library. There's so many rules. Nobody can know everything. So I came up with three rules and, and it was really based upon everything everybody drilled into me uh, throughout my entire Navy life. I don't want to say career. I want to call it a Navy life uh, because I'm not really retired. When you're retired, you're really retained. 
<laughs> they can recall me back to active duty and I would go in a heartbeat um, if they did. So I, I, I thought to myself, everyone has a command statement guidance. And then I read this really thin book by this submariner. And he said, only do things in threes. People don't remember things in threes. And then I remember every time you hear, it's mostly black ministers. They're really good at this. They'll repeat themselves like three times up front and all the way through, they'll repeat themselves. And at the end, it's usually three times again. And if at the end of the whole thing, you haven't gotten it, uh, you haven't gotten it in your brain dead <laughs> or you're not paying attention or you're too drunk or whatever. Um, so I thought, okay, I'm going to have three rules. And, and all the great generals and everything, they all had 10 rules. And I couldn't remember all the 10 rules. I only remember one rule. Colin Powell had all these rules. And the one I remembered what, was never, it goes something like, um, never attach your ego to your position because when your position falls, your ego is going to go with it. <laughs> And there's a staff officer in the joint staff working for the chairman of the joint chiefs of staff. That was like the best advice you can get. In other words, it's not your point paper, kid. It belongs to the chairman, you know? So, yeah. Um, so at any rate, I made these three rules. And the first rule was, and it was drilled into me by a number of people to include um, a very storied seal we had by the name of Dick Marcinko. When I got commissioned, I asked him, I said, um, if you were going to give an ensign advice, one bit of advice, what it would be, he looked at me, he said, take care of your men. That's all he said. I worked for another great captain and he had a command statement. And his very first thing was my policy is simple. It is people. So my first rule was take care of your people. They're your most important assets. My second rule was Never compromise your personal integrity. And I told people, you lie to somebody once, they're never going to believe you again. And, and that's a stiff price to pay. Uh, the third rule was prepare for total war because when I first came in the Navy, nuclear war was on the table. Uh, and, you know, it was. Um, and when I got the SEAL Team 1, one of my jobs as an officer was, I was a nuclear weapons officer. Think about that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and, but then when, after 9-11, I modified the third rule. And it was prepare for total war when called upon the fight, win. So I would tell people, I'd give like an hour lecture on this thing, but, but I won't do that here. Uh, obviously, the first one... Everything's about people. So when I had to give the speech to Maryland Summer Jazz, I told him, I said, you know, my, here's my rules. And I said, I developed them for combat troops because this is what we did. But let me show you what I can do for music or for anything else. Take care of your musicians. They're your most important assets. Never compromise your musical integrity. Prepare for total music when called upon to perform, win the audience. My three rules work for anything you give me, anything, any discipline. You could take my three rules and with a little bit of modification, they're your rules. And I've told other people, steal my rules. I want you to. They're not mine. They're God's. He just put them in my head one day. And, and um, so... Um, uh, so, so those were the three rules. So I always tell people about my three rules. And then I tell them, read, read The Alchemist by Paolo Coelho. I read it all the time. Paolo Coelho says he reads his first book all the time. You can Think check it out of the library as well. What's well, that? You can check it out of the library as well, even for, um, um, most people don't know. Nowadays, the library allows you to uh, check out books digitally as well. Yeah. I like hard copy. Yeah, a lot of people do. They want to feel the book in their hand. I got uh, that, Warrior of Light, a bunch of his other books. And that is that is my go-to. If I've got to give somebody a book for a present, I get the hard copy edition. That's the book I give. I don't care how old they are. That's the book I give everybody. <laughs> 
So, okay, so Peter, t tell first of all, let me let me ask you, how can people find out more about your music and where you're playing? How can they get information about your band? Um, I promise, promise next week I'm going to get uh, since I've got the um, the gig next Tuesday. Everything I'm doing is. I'm not doing anything but focusing on the music and, and, and on the tunes, other than watering my garden. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so after that, I've got a couple gigs next month. Uh, I'm going to get back on my website and I'm going to, I have some friends. It was the Pete Weichel Jazz Band and then the, um, the, the, the email was PeteWeichelJazz.com. Uh, but since I'm good and I have some friends that are what, really good branders and they do all my posters and stuff, they said, it's too long. Just do Pete Michael band because it, if you want to play some other types of music, you're not just locked into jazz. Uh, so it's like, okay, so now it's Pete Michael band. So now I'm thinking I'm going to have to change my email address instead of Pete Michael jazz to Pete Michael band. So I've got to do all that stuff. And so. Um, well, well, we'll put the link up, you know, for uh, with the video uh, so that anybody who wants to go over to your site will be able to check out more information about the band, what your schedule is for appearances. Well, thank you. Um, now, I also would like to put up something in terms of veterans. Uh, you mentioned earlier the, the problem that still exists. Uh, you know, the, that there's the homelessness, how can people help? How do you recommend people help with uh, veterans causes and, and homelessness with the veterans? There's a number of organizations which, um, which help homeless veterans. And so if, if you're not going to get involved personally, donate to them, find out what they are and check out their status if they're a 501c3. You can always find out, you know, how they're rated. Um, the other thing everyone can do is they can spend uh, probably 15 minutes studying the problem on the internet and then realize how many veterans a year commit suicide and write their congressmen, their representatives, and the president and say, how come this keeps getting worse? It's the smallest segment of the population. I once gave a speech for something called a reason to ride and, it, and the speech was the 1%. And so the, I, the, at the time, the amount of people that were serving at any one point, it was less than half a percent that serve. And it's like, okay, the 1% protects the 99% the the it's like 0.038 but so you can't say that in the speech so i just said the one percent so it makes it easy to say so the one percent protects the 99 percent when things go bad who do you call on it's the one percent and blah 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 and then a, a, a smaller percentage of that are homeless and a bunch are committing suicide and so people ought to look up at the statistics going back to the last 10 or 15 years and and you'll see that this is like it's like increased. And if you look at the, the, the wall in, the, you know, the, the Vietnam Wall Memorial, they probably ought to build at least two more walls because probably that many more people, if, if you, there's guys that really study this in the VA and everything, and there's some books written. And one guy said that he thought two more walls should be, should be built because probably that many more another 40 or 50,000 Vietnam vets probably took their own life. Um, and, you know, uh, and if it's not suicide and they got really drunk and got on their motorcycle, we know what the intention is. It's, so it, it's, it's a terrible thing and it's not going away and it keeps getting worse. And uh, so what, what, what are we doing for them? I, I live in a town where this do doesn't exist. You know, but if somebody comes up to me and they ask for help, I'm going to give it to them. And the other thing we can do is we can educate people. So sure. now I have an opportunity to talk about it to other people. I bring it up and I tell them, do something. Go ahead and make a contribution somewhere. Great. 
so again, an important issue. Uh, and thank you for talking to us about it and for coming on the podcast. I really appreciate your time. It was wonderful to talk to you. You're interesting. And I wish you luck with your, your new career. I can see the passion uh, glowing uh, as you talk about it. So best of luck. And thank you for being here and joining us and sharing your story. Tony, thanks for, uh, for having me. It was, uh, it was a pleasure.